Hi, this is Walt Boys. I'm the editor of Eric Flint's Ring of Fire Press, and I'm the editor of the Grantville Gazette. I also write things, but mostly I'm an editor. So what we're going to be talking about for the next hour with this distinguished group of guests uh, is how to work with editors. So why don't we start, Chris, why don't we start with you? Uh, and if you'd introduce yourself and uh, say whatever you'd like to say off the top of your head about working with editors. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Christopher Rocchio. I, I write a science fantasy series called The Sun Eater for Daw Books, but I'm also the junior editor at Bain Books. I work with uh, Jim Minns here and uh, Tony Daniel, Tony Weisskopf, and with writers like David Weber and Lois Bujold. And so I've got a, a bit of a, you know, a foot on either side of the editorial author divide. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's me. Ed? Hi. Ed Lerner. I write uh, science fiction, techno thrillers, occasionally popular science as Edward M. Lerner. I'm probably best known for the Fleet of Worlds series uh, in collaboration with Larry Niven and the Interstellar Net series, which is a solo. Uh, as for author versus editor split, I'm 100% on the author side. <laughs> Good for you. Jim? Hi there. I'm Jim Minns. I'm executive editor at Bain Books. I've been working in genre publishing for more than a quarter century now. Uh, I started out my career working for Tor Books. I uh, spent a couple years at Delray Random House. And on the centennial of Heinlein's birth, I joined Bain Books. And I've been there ever since. And I bring Heinlein up because I definitely come in Strictly from the editorial side. So we've got Ed on one side, Christopher in the middle, and I'm on that other end. And Heinlein's rule number three, of course, is you must refrain from rewriting except to order editorial order. That's Melinda. Come in. Hi. Um, well, I'm Melinda Snodgrass. I'm an author and novelist, also a screenwriter. And so I'm mostly on the author side, although I am the co-editor of Wild Cards with George R.R. Martin, which is our big shared world anthology, which is um, a little bit like herding cats uh, because we have some 30 odd writers that we pull together and, you know, make them play nicely in a sandbox. Um, so I've had some experience editing and, and I suppose uh, working in television as an executive producer, I give notes to my writers on their scripts. So I, I have that experience, but it's, it's a somewhat different animal. And I love editors so because they make me look better every time I write a book. Only if we're doing the job right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. I, uh, I've, I, I share your belief that shared world universes are um, <laughs> herding cats. Um, Eric Flint and I run the largest shared world universe that we know of in the history of science fiction. It's as big as some uh, games universes. Uh, we've, turned, we've turned out 175 now, writers who got their first published sale um, from selling to the Grantville Gazette. Uh, and Ring of Fire Press is going to do something really cool on the 1st of October. We're going to start issuing one book a week. So we're, we're not a terribly small press anymore. This is a little scary <laughs> considering we've been doing this for four years and we're up to a book a week. And we're, and we're scheduled out to March or so. We've got enough. We, we, we don't need any new books until March. We, we, are, we are collecting books. We are uh, still looking at that. So um, being an editor for Ring of Fire Press has is, is become very fulfilling because uh, I get to work with um, new writers a lot. And, and that's fun to take somebody who's never written before or never written professionally or not good enough to write professionally and get them to the point where they are. Um, and that is, that is so cool when that happens. Um, and then you get to work with, uh, with people like Ed, uh, who uh, uh, is an old lag at, uh, at writing for an editor. 
Um, he's given me a bunch of stories over the last couple of years, uh, one of which we made into um, a, uh, a novel called The Company Man. Um, and it might be interesting, Ed, for you to describe how the sequence of how that worked. Okay. Well, The Company Man began as a novelette. It was a noir-inspired detective story, but set in uh, the asteroid belt. And like many stories in real life, it didn't tie up every loose end. So I was at the end of the story, but there were loose ends. When uh, Walt and Eric saw it, they said, you know, this calls out for a sequel. I said, that's okay. I'm already working on it. Um, by the time I got to the end of what I uh, wanted to do, I was up to two novelettes and two novellas. The novellas were each published in two parts. Uh, I don't recall which of us first said, you know, we can put these together into a book, but it was a pretty obvious next step. And I was delighted to have my first uh, Ring of Fire book come out last October. And the old fuddy-duddy in me does want to point out that is, of course, the tip of the hat to how genre publishing in America in the modern era came about. It started with the pulps, and what were serialized stories or linked stories eventually became mashups that became novels, and that's where we got our first novels published in science fiction and fantasy back in the day, even before my time. And that's all I want to see that continuum and how even with the change of technology and how EPUB and all the rest is out there, we're still following similar modes of storytelling because in the end, it's all about getting the words in front of the writers and the readers. Certainly not all of my novels have followed that sort of uh, path, but several have. And sometimes it's fun to just write a shorter story and then see how you can build on it instead of setting out from the get-go to write a novel. Melinda? Well, I, I've not done much of that. I'm, I'm terrified of shorter work, actually, um, except I do screenplays, and that doesn't, you know, that is sort of a shorter work. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, short stories to me are, 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 they're little jewels, and they're very hard to do well. So I tend to be, you know, a novelist. I have a, a number of series that I write, a space opera, um, a sort of occult thriller thing and you know a thing about a law firm that I used to be a lawyer before I got better and became a writer um, and uh, so you know I sort of have drawn on all of that you know I think that for me having someone to bounce I, I'm a I'm an architect I outline everything and part of that comes from being in screenwriting because we break every story either mm -hmm. on a corporate and I write novels the same way. I'm in the process of doing that now on a novel I'm working on. Um, and if you have a partnership with a really good editor, one of the things I've loved being able to do, if I can't plot break with fellow writers, and I've done that a lot, but it's nice if you sold a book or sold a series to be able to call your editor and go, I'm thinking about doing this particular thing with this character. Tell me if I'm crazy, you know, because I, I usually start by sending an, um, a proposal to my agent who then sends it on, which is, you know, a few chapters and then a big synopsis. And I, I'm pretty good at them because of the Hollywood thing. But once it's purchased and the uh, editor is familiar with what I'm doing, it's really nice to have that give and take and to have them say, Ooh, you know, I, I don't know if you want to go, you know, that's pretty wild. Maybe, you know, pull it back or have you considered this other thing? So, you know, I, I think that's one of the values is just, you know, we get so into the stories that we can't see the bigger picture and having an editor who's sort of, you know, floating above us going, but, but, but have you looked at this? I, I think is really helpful. Um, and, and so that's why another reason I really love good editors. And there are also bad ones. <laughs> have you ever oh, yeah. had have you had one of those um mostly in hollywood <laughs> not i've been fortunate um i mean i've had 
I've had one editor in book publishing who basically didn't give me anything other than could you, you know, kind of change happy to glad in this sentence, which um, wasn't helpful. I really like an editor who digs in, mm -hmm. um, really discusses with me. So I've been very fortunate on the, on the novel side with my editors and I've had good and bad with showrunners and, you know, studio executives in Hollywood, um, you know, some of which are just, you know, crazy. Like, could you put a giant B in this, in this scene? I'm like, why? <laughs> why would we want a giant B in the tender love moment? Well, because it was boring, you know, because they were just talking about how they feel about each other. <laughs> it's like music, you know, you sort of, sometimes you have forte and other times you need a little piano, a little legato. Yeah, that was not a, that was not a great experience. It stung, didn't it? <laughs> it yes. Oh, ouch. <laughs> Go in the corner and behave yourself. Christopher? Uh, well, Rick, I, you, you straddle the line. Um, yeah. Um, do you find every so often that, you're, that, that your editor side takes over when you're writing? Uh, and is that good or bad? Uh, not so much. I uh, actually uh, want to echo a lot of what Melinda said. I, I too outline pretty heavily, so I get a lot of the sort of thinking uh, out of the way ahead of writing, and I try to keep uh, I try to keep myself from editing as I'm writing because those are I don't know if they're literally different parts of one's brain, but they feel like different parts of one's brain. Um, and so I try to do I try to do one at a time. Although I'll make notes for things, you know, I should go back and change that later. Um, but I, I try to stay in one gear, one gear at a time. Uh, the most useful thing I think uh, for uh, having been on both sides of this particular uh, divide is that I know the things that authors do to editors that are annoying and vice versa. And I try uh, particularly hard not to do those things. Mostly uh, uh, not answering emails in both directions is very frustrating. So if some, uh, you know, uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I've, I've had to wait a little bit too long for certain replies. And so when I am on the other side of, especially working as an editor, uh, I'd like, okay, these people want an answer quickly um, because uh, you know, they have a problem they're trying to solve. And, and so a lot of like soft professional skills, I think have, uh, has been the, uh, the big takeaway from having had a foot in either camp. Okay. Um... When you're working, you author folks, when you're working with an editor, um, when do you say to the editor, okay, that's enough. Uh, I'm not going to change that. And, and why do you dig in your heels when you do? Okay, I'll take a crack at that. Good. I learned that- and Yes, I are, am buying it. <laughs> there are two ways to take uh, every comment from an editor. On the one hand, they're uh, teaching moments. There is some comment that ought to be considered. And not every word that flows out of my fingertips is going to be right on the first, second, or third try. I get that. On the other hand, virtually every comment from an editor once uh, a project has been purchased is a suggestion, not a commandment. And uh, that was very empowering to learn. Uh, occasionally, an editor will come up with a comment that would stand a story completely on its head. And it was good to learn that uh, it's okay to say no. Um, an editor who is not on this call once really liked a story I had submitted, which had a downbeat ending and said, I'll buy this, but it needs a happy ending. And I thought about it and I decided that's a different story. That's not the one I wrote. That's not the one I want to write. And in that case, it was uh, thanks, but no thanks. But uh, that's been rare. Mm hmm yeah, it's been it's been rare for me too. And and normally, <clears throat> the question that I always ask um, when when an editor or or someone, if I'm working on a screenplay, comes back and says, "Well, you know," and they always have a suggestion. Well, hopefully they have a suggestion instead of saying this doesn't work. That's not helpful. I mean, it, when I edit for wild cards, you know, I don't 
ever tell a writer, you know, I don't know what's wrong, but you need to fix it because this isn't working. You know, that, that just leaves the writer at, at loose ends. Um, and so they usually try to come back with a suggestion and sometimes they're just completely offbeat. And so normally, even while I'm going, that's a very interesting idea. Let me consider that. I'm trying to figure out what it is that they're actually being, what is actually bothering them. Because it's normally not the thing they're saying to you. It's like they're, they're groping for what the issue is. And, um, and it's that question of stepping back and saying, okay, why are they bumping? You know, what are they trying to say that they haven't totally internalized? And if you can figure that out, you can find a solution that is still in line with what you want to do, doesn't do violence to your story or your script, but answers, you know, removes that discomfort that they're feeling. But, but um, it, sometimes I feel like we have to be psychologists or psychiatrists in addition to writers. <laughs> I often talk about that as being the why, not the what. Why are you getting that feedback? And that indeed, you know, as Melinda was saying, a lot of times the editorial feedback should be about, you know, there is a problem here. You know, why are they saying this? Not what are they saying? And indeed, as an editor, that fine line of pointing out where there are weaknesses versus inserting yourself too much into the process you know, if you're really into the story yourself, invested even as an editor, sometimes you get a little hands-on and you need to back off because, you know, revisions by road are not what you want. You want to be in the spirit of the story, but inspire that author to come up with an even better idea than you could. Otherwise, you know, hey, I'd be doing the writing. Um, the whole point is to help them identify what's the best in their story and bring that out. And that can be, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's very difficult. And you get to that point where you get so in sync with an author and if it's a longer novel and you come out thinking, you know, are we just drinking the Kool-Aid? Are we both crazy here? Or is this actually really coming together? What, what do you do when you know there's something off, but you can't put your finger on it? Uh, how do you deal with that? You got to tell the author. Right. You know, there's something, there's, there's something wrong here. And I, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there's something wrong here. How do you get past that? Well, that's when you start talking, right? Because uh, you might not know what it is, you know, off, uh, you know, at go. But as you go back and forth working with the author, uh, you might stumble over what exactly the problem is in conversation. You know, editing is fundamentally a conversation. Uh, and it is one that I think the author uh, should lead, right? You know, at, like like Melinda and, and Ed were saying, uh, you may uh, diagnose that there's a problem uh, and the editor might propose a, solu a solution, right? You know, they'd be saying, I don't like what you did here with X, try Y. And the author will be like, mm, Y won't work. And, and that's very often because there might just be something ahead, either in the next book mm -hmm. or later in the same book, the, uh, the editor either is, isn't thinking about or doesn't know about because um, you haven't told them yet, you haven't written the next book. Um, so you might say, no, Y won't work either, but maybe Z or A or even B or C, and you'll, you have to keep working at it. Very rarely, uh, I found the offered uh, suggestion is the right one, um, but it does at least start me down a road um, to finding whatever the, the better choice is going to be. Yeah, it seems to me that there's a... Um, there's a line that editors have to stay on one side of. Um, and even when, we're, um, uh, even when we're trying to help and even when we know what the answer is, sometimes it's better to lead the author there rather than grabbing the author's nose and dragging them there. Yeah, better to teach them how to fish than to give them a fish. Yeah, that's true. There's all kinds of fishy proverbs there <laughs> that we can do. Uh, <laughs> and, and indeed, all this represents a spectrum. I mean, it can be to the point where you're actually dissecting dialogue on a line-by-line -line basis. You hope it never comes to that, but that happens. There are books out there that should undoubtedly have a co-author credit for me, but there are also ones where I've done no more than query three uses of words in dialogue. And yes, yeah. that was when I was working on Gene Wolfe. Um, but, you know, it can even get to the point where your comment may be as simple as make this not suck. I've never used that line, but a certain editor I work for has. And, you know, 
it can be a question of just making the author work at it themselves first. That would be on an early draft or a first draft, not on something that's more polished, obviously, where you're simply identifying, hey, this scene doesn't work. I mean, there are some useful tools I like to suggest, and it, it can break down to certain elemental uh, elements. I mean, you know, in a plot-driven story, uh, especially with novels, obviously there's different approaches for writing short fiction that's much more varied but it should be advancing the plot, providing necessary character background info, or providing necessary world building. And it should be doing at least two, probably all three, otherwise it's not getting the job done. And if you keep that in mind, a lot of times you can start figuring out, oh, well, I love this witty dialogue, but it's doing nothing but witty dialogue. Where, how can I get some kind of plot element into it? How can I get some kind of necessary information that will help advance the story or provide information needed for the story? and things like that. Keep There's that an in interesting mind. case. Um, does not involve any of you combined author editors personally, uh, but dealing with editors who are also authors, sometimes they forget which hat they're wearing and get a little bit too uh, over enthusiastic about the suggestions they make. Yeah. And when that happens, the real author has to step in and say, okay, this is my book. And that's the most important thing we should be talking about. In the end, it's the author's name that's going on the cover and they have to be comfortable with what's there. If not, then, you know, it's work for hire. <clears throat> right. <laughs> it's, that's true. Uh, that's, that's true. It's, it, it is w one of the things that, that I know that I should do more of is I err on the side of being hands off. Yes. Because I, I, I have been an author um, uh, and I, I want the editor to give me suggestions, not orders. Right. Um, and so I tend to say things like, what I would like you to do is to take the first third of this and read it out loud, record yeah. it if you can, because that will show you what is wrong with the pacing. That often helps. And reading out loud for dialogue is an absolute must is another useful tool. Oh, yeah. Absolute must. You should always read. It is worthwhile to read everything out loud, but in particular when you're paying attention mm -hmm. to dialogue. A lot of times it becomes a question of you know, differentiating by voice and things like that. But an absolute must. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to throw in that um, I wasn't, novelist before I ended up in Hollywood and then, you know, sort of now have a foot in each camp. I firmly feel like I became a much better novelist after I'd written screenplays for a while um, because there is no wasted time. I mean, you, every word has to carry this because you've only got, you know, 47 minutes or, or mm -hmm. two hours. And so you have to say, what does the scene do? What is this exchange doing? Um, how is the pacing, all of those things, and, and reading the dialogue aloud is critical. I, do, I did that on the novels even before, but especially after going to Hollywood and working with that. And I, I teach quite a bit. I've, I've been asked to teach classes, um, writing classes, both generally screenwriting, but generally writing. And, and even in our, our crit group um, that, you know, now we have a pandemic, so we can't do that as much as we used to, but I would, I'll usually ask an author, especially a beginning writer, tell me what this book is about, but don't tell me the plot. What is the theme of this book? Because for myself, mm -hmm. the first thing I figure out is what is the theme? And then I figure out, I mean, um, I, I said once in a panel discussion, you know, plot is the stuff that happens, although I used a rougher word, and theme is why it matters. And a lot of writers get hung up on the, the busyness of, of mm -hmm. plot. And so um, I, I always try to go back to that sort of at its heart. What, what are you trying to say about the human condition or the heart in conflict with itself? You know, that, that to me is, um, and then the rest of it flows from there. You know, you you have just described the most amazing training for writing short stories, because <laughs> yeah. because just like a uh, uh, just like a screenplay, 
there's no wasted space. There's no wasted words in a short story. Every word you put on paper has to advance the plot or the theme. And if it's not, then take it out. Um, and that's really, really hard uh, for, uh, for, for writers to, to actually learn. Um, Ed, you're really good at writing short fiction. Uh, oh, thank you. Is that, uh, is that your experience as well? My first professional sale, quite by fluke, I think, happened to be a novel, my first novel. And the manuscript I submitted was about 90,000 words. This was quite a while ago, back when books were short and not uh, doorstops. And the way they're getting again. Yeah. And the, the offer I got was, you know, we really like this book, uh, but can you cut it down to uh, 75,000 words? Now, this was going to be my first professional sale. So, of course, the answer was yes, sir. But learning to chop 20% out of really my first pro writing job, that uh, really focused the mind. Yes, it does. Most carefully. I, I remember getting a call from an editor. Uh, I had sent m my requested story in for this anthology, and it was 6,200 words. And I thought that it was very tight and everything was really, really nice. And then the editor called me up and said, you got to take uh, your story down to 5,000 words. I said, why? And he said, because I just got a story from Mike Resnick and um, I'm putting it in. And if we put in both your story and his story, we're over. And I said, okay. And I learned exactly how much air there was in that story. There's a lot more air than, than, I, than I dreamed there was. I got 1,200 words out of that story. It took me five agonizing days, but I did it. Uh, That's a great teaching tool. If you're ever at a writer's workshop or working with a writer's group, somebody submits a story, you tell them, make it 20% shorter. Yep. Period. Just as a learn how actually, and, and I'll be honest, I, m my career bridges enough that not everybody was writing on computers when I got started. And honestly, the advent of the personal computer has led to a lot more uh, verbal diarrhea where people will put a lot more words on the page than is necessary. And, you know, it's, don't get me wrong, uh, Tolkien, epic fantasy, true immersion, escapist secondary stories are my, not only my bread and butter, but my passion. And yet there's so much extraneous being put into works these days. And, you know, the more, you know, the, the longer you do this, the more you appreciate an elegant turn of phrase. The ability to say a lot with very little. I mean, Heinlein was the master, especially in his short fiction, with eight opening sentence, he could say more than a lot of modern novelists can't get done in a chapter. Oh, um, yeah. Just implying what this means, the choice of words. Melinda, One you of the something? first lessons I got in writing was that the secret to writing is rewriting. And until things have been rewritten a few times, they're always too wordy. You know, I do feel like um, having been on both sides of this, um, it's a lot easier to cut than it is to add. And so I usually advocate that everything go in initially and then come at it with a hatchet. Um, because I've been on the side where I, I wrote a script that, you know, the director said, oh, we're going to run long. And he made me he cut a bunch of scenes and we came in 10 minutes short. And trying to write 10 minutes of filler for a script and then shoot it, you know, fast was agony. And they were horrible scenes because they, they were just sort of tacked on because the things that had been there. So I actually, I agreed him completely that everything is just, there's too much. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're going to throw yourself into it, 
I would rather not have an author or editor say to me, you know, this thing feels a little short. Could you have a few more chapters? Because then I'm like, oh, you know, I, I, that, that's hard. That to me is a harder task than, than coming at it with a knife and, and carving away the, the extra bits. And that's where I think the editor, I mean, one of the best editorial notes I got was on a third, a, the third Carolingian book. I had this whole subplot and it was a cool subplot, but she said, it really kind of takes us away from the main story. And when I cut it out and just bridged over it, the book got so much better. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to her for that note. So that, that's one thing I do say is I think cutting is better. I mean, I'm curious to the other writers, I don't finish a book and then do a, I mean, I do a rewrite after, but <clears throat> I rewrite as I go. I reread yesterday, the day, my work from the day before, I read it and rewrite it before I begin my day's work. It kind of puts me back in the moment. I've never understood being able to just blitz through a book and then go back and rewrite. I have to rewrite as I go. So by the time I'm done, it feels like the book's been rewritten about three times anyway before you know I'm actually writing, typing the end. But how do other people do that? Do, do you when work? I'm writing, uh, I, do it, I do it exactly the same way you do. Um, I've never been able to not do that. Uh, I've been told that it's the wrong way to do it. Uh, but as near as I can tell, there is no wrong way to do it. Right. Yeah, Everybody, everyone's got their own similar paths. I but, do just keep going though. I, I might look at like the last page again to sort of get myself back in the, uh, you know, the space I was in, especially if I had to stop in the middle of, you know, a scene or something, which, you know, happens. Um, but I find that I, if I start to agonize over uh, what I did the day before, or two days before, I, that I won't get anything done that day. Um, and it takes a lot longer for me to finish a project if I do that. Um, and so while I don't think there's a wrong way to do it, I do think there are wrong ways for, you know, individual people, um, mm -hmm. and, and sticking to, uh, and, and rewriting, uh, things that I've just written is, is going to cost me a lot of time. Um, it might, I, I definitely see an argument for doing it, but I just can't, uh, I, I can't, I can't do it myself. Um, and so when I, what I'll do when I'm done is I'll, I'll go and I'll reread the whole book again out loud if I have the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes things cut, get a little bit too too close. Uh, but I'll go ahead and reread everything, and that's when I'll catch a lot of the stuff that doesn't quite um, doesn't quite fit or or doesn't flow properly, uh, mm -hmm. especially at like the syntactic level, right? Sentence and dialogue, like we're talking about, you know. Um, but I I'll, I'll try and get everything. That's why I outline so thoroughly. I think the outline for this book that I'm working on now is like 40,000 words. It's already a book. Um, Cause I write, I do write the door stoppers. Um, and uh, having done that, I've written kind of a low resolution first draft anyway. And so then I, in actually writing the real first draft, I'm kind of writing a second draft, at least it's what I, you know, how it feels to me. So. Uh, I, I that's a good, that's really a good way to look at it. Ed, how do you, how do you deal with it? My first drafts of each scene tend to be too terse. It's a rare evening um, when I don't wind up scribbling notes to myself with uh, follow-up thoughts, what that scene is needing, whether it's better lines of dialogue or more description of the setting or uh, notions of foreshadowing I need to be dropping into that scene. So, uh, every day when I start writing again, the first thing I do is process the notes from the night before. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like Melinda's system with the, the scribbled notes. Now, a lot of the, these notes, when I say the night before, I do mean literally the night before. I keep a pad of post-it notes uh, on my nightstand and I'll wake up and scribble myself a note and go back to sleep and then wake up and scribble another note. And on a really bad night, I can have 10, 15 post-it notes sitting on my nightstand by the time I get up. Usually I can decipher about three quarters of them the next morning. But my wife appreciates that I don't turn on the light to write these notes. Wow, that's impressive. 
Uh, I'll say this too. Um, we've already described, the authors have described how it is. Everyone's got their own process. A lot of them follow similar paths. A couple of just general pieces of it, the younger writers in terms of their careers out there, uh, you know, Christopher referred to it a little bit, but very, I'll uh, put it quite uh, uh, plainly, you know, it's very useful to have a gap of time and then revisit your work and do the read out loud and that kind of stuff, because you will see things if you've got even better, if you've got a little bit of other writing you've gotten done and then return to it. So there's a little bit of spacing because that's where you're going to find a lot of the little stuff that your eyes aren't even seeing because you're too familiar with the words from missing words, repeated words, a lot of little things like that. Um, and also the other thing I'll definitely warn uh, aspiring writers of, you know, don't fall into the revision trap of writing and rewriting and rewriting to try and make your one story you finish, your one novel you finish, absolutely perfect. You know, get it to the point, you know, you should take a second look at it, you should get through the process, but you're going to learn a lot more writing the next work. And probably by the time you write your third full length work, you'll begin to find your authorial voice. I mean, that's with, I can't tell you how many authors I've worked with over the years. It's when they get to that third book, they really finally hit their stride, whether mm -hmm. it's published or not, or something that's rotting in a drawer somewhere. You got to get through this process and try to write more and more and don't, don't fall for the revision trap of just trying to make every word perfect, especially for full length works. Before I became a writer, I worked in high tech for 30 years. Um, and there's a saying in uh, product development, for every product, the time comes when you have to shoot the engineers and ship. Yep. So stories are like that too. Yep. Uh, when I'm doing my final pass, because I also do the end-to-end -end read, of course, um, I discover that if I'm changing only a few percent uh, in word length on a given pass, at this point, I'm, it's pointless to keep rewriting myself. Mm -hmm. So well, just I that, was not wrong. Yeah. The numeric check turns out to be worthwhile. You know, spending the amount of time it takes to read through a novel manuscript a couple of times if virtually nothing is changing and you're switching back and forth between the same two words in a sentence. It's time to shoot the author and ship. Yep. Stop, stop fiddling, yes. <laughs> I, just had a, I just had an experience that, that really shows that. Uh, I won't mention the author's name, um, but uh, the author had never worked with um, uh, using track changes uh, and uh, um, and word uh, and corrections in word before. And so the author did it wrong. Um, I put all the corrections back in the way that they should have been sent it back to the author. Um, and the author went through and, and, and uh, finally figured out how to do it right and did it. And then the author said to me, I don't ever want to see this book again. <laughs> I, and I said, but you wrote it. And she said, I don't ever want to see this book again. And I can't say that I blame her. Uh, um, I, uh, I, I just can't. Uh, so th that's part of the, that's part of the thing that makes Eric, some editors uh, unloved is the, uh, the, the final, the final strokes, the proofreading, the copy editing, yeah. um, where where there is absolutely nothing to do but to roll up your sleeves and grunt through it. Uh, and and those are actually some of the most important steps. I mean, that is what takes it from being a you know a rough manuscript to fine as polished work. And a lot of the self-published people out there are people thinking about self-publishing. You should still be getting a copy edit if you can find yourself somebody to do who's capable to do such a thing. You'd still need a final proofing, and that again is where having to step away from the work and coming back to it clean, so that you get a chance to do it. And ideally, yes, the person who creates it should be part of the process. But yes, uh, when Larry Korea's proofs come in, you know, 
he'll if he's got time he'll take a look at it but he really you know relies upon us to make sure we have very good proofreaders because he doesn't want to read it yet yet again and that just goes with the territory of if you've done the work you've done the revisions you've looked at the copy edit and now here it is in the final typesetting stage you know letting the pros do their job um, but it's an absolutely essential part of the process to put out the best novel, best short story you can. Ironically, there is no such thing as a perfect manuscript, no matter how many times it's read. There will um, always be a typo in a final book. We, yes. we expect um, myself and my managing editor for the Grant Bill Gazette read every manuscript three times. I read it when it comes in the door, he reads it, I read it after he's done, and then we go to anywhere between three and six uh, volunteer proofreaders. And there are still mistakes. I have never, mm -hmm. even when I was working in uh, um, professional magazines, um, there's never a clean copy. I mean, anything. There's always at least one or two typos. And, and uh, typos will get reintroduced too. If an old book's getting scanned for a new edition, uh, you know, letters uh, C and L will turn into a D, right? Just because the scanner is not acute enough. So I'll find typos in, you know, writers who've been dead's work, uh, you know, uh, I'll find typos in old Fritz Leiber stories, or I'm, you know, I've cleaned up Heinlein before, which is always a little nerve wracking. Um, a good thing he's dead, Christopher. <laughs> it's a really good thing that he's dead. I'll be honest. It's also probably just as well. Ginny is no longer with us either. Cause, uh, his well, Jimmy widow, was his widow, Yeah, his widow was also very protective of his words. So and understandably, but uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, but those he had a, uh, he had a uh, very strange um, attitude toward ARCs. Uh, he refused to allow ARCs to be out in the world. If you received an ARC and you did not send it back after you wrote your review, you would get, as I did one time. Um, a nice letter from a very, very, very mean Philadelphia lawyer who said things like, send it back or very bad things will happen to you and you have until Friday to do it. Uh, and just to make sure folks know, ARC refers to advanced reading copy or what we used to call back in the day, the page proofs, whether the unbound or in this case bound mm -hmm page proofs or bound galleys as it were because i'm a fuddy duddy and always talk in the old terms and or these are the copies that are produced from the once the manuscripts first been typeset but before final proofreading in order to get it out enough lead time for reviewers to have a chance to get into their magazines and things like that and so the understanding is indeed these are called the advanced uncorrected page proofs they haven't been proofread yet it should be, in theory, the final manuscript. It usually is. Every once in a while, a the big series with a very desperate manuscript may be a little rough even at that stage, but usually that's not the case for 99.999% of the books. But indeed, there's going to be typos in that, very much so, understanding, because you know, in this day with electronic text and electronic manuscripts, the amount of typos introduced is a lot less than when I started in the business and somebody was at a keyboard retyping the manuscript into the high speed printers uh, works or setting it. Yes. In the old fashioned you know, you, well you mentioned, Jim, you mentioned that uh, the advent of personal computers um, started the trend toward book bloat. Um, and I've noticed from a couple of authors who do it, not mentioning any names at all, um, the advent of text to speech or speech to text has done exactly the same thing. Um, I know one writer who writes bricks, um, who writes 20% more brick uh, than he used to um, before he started dictating his books. Uh, and uh, so this, the, the, it, it, it's interesting when you are an editor to have to go back to that author or an, another author and say, um, this is feeling a little top heavy. 
could you could you take some out of this just a little bit here um yeah um i've got a question for the for the panel here and i might be putting christopher on the spot but uh, i know personally still for me when it comes to editorial work even if i'm going to be giving an author work feedback in an electronic form with track change and stuff like that i'm still going to be editing a physical manuscript because i do a better job blog versus digital and i think that honestly even people who claim they do better work electronically i bet you if you made them put them to the test and put the printed page in front of them they might actually spot more i'm curious as to what the experience has been for the rest of y'all on that front in terms of wor working on, on this is more the revision and potentially editing uh depending on your role and things well, I'd certainly much rather do line edits uh, with, with a printed manuscript if I could, just because track changes are kind of the pain in the neck to fiddle with when you have to do that many of them, um, at least in my opinion. Uh, it's much easier to just take the red pen and, and, and do things the old-fashioned way. I do think that input technology dramatically changes a, a writer or an editor's relationship with the text. I think... Uh, Ben Yala was telling me that uh, L. Ron Hubbard used a uh, roll of butcher's paper in his typewriter because he could type faster and and, and more efficiently that way, um, you know. And, and uh, maybe not as well. Maybe not well. Maybe but... not as well. No, but uh, you know, if he needed to write, you know, a novella overnight, which I understood he did kind of habitually, um, you know, that sort of thing helps. And I think that the word processor does. Um, you know, it does cause the bloat that we're talking about, but it does also let people work more quickly. If, you know, um, again, maybe not as well, um, but, uh, you know, there's, it would be interesting to take the same writer and have them do a project with pen and paper, right? And then with the word processor and, and then see how stylistically things differed it would be an interesting experiment. The fun part would then be the social media commentary from all the fans for if it's a popular author with a big series, how dare you take the time to head write something to slow down the output. I want my novels now. Well, there's always that. <laughs> Linda, we haven't heard from you for a while. I think I should. I mean, I know I should probably print out um, a manuscript and proof it pen and paper. I don't, and, and, and it's a terrible confession. Um, I, you know, part of it is that I, I find I'm more focused on the screen. I mean, I'm always, if I've got the paper and I'm shuffling it around, also I have terrible handwriting. My, 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 my mother used to say, you know, you really should have been a doctor, not a lawyer. Um, and so if I'm making notes to myself, sometimes I'll come back and go, what on earth did I write there? And if I do it in the moment as I'm on the screen, then it's clean and I can read it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you're, you're inspiring me, though, to go ahead and print out this book I just finished and go poke at it with a red pen again. Um, and it's interesting because the last big wild cards book, um, I did the full edit on it because George is writing game, you know, he is writing Winds of Winter people. Um, and so I was responsible, but it was a mosaic novel where I had to weave together six writers into something that looks like a novel, even though it's, it's actually five individual authors. And in that case, I did a pass electronically, then I printed it all out because I had to fit it together like a jigsaw puzzle. Right. And I think it did actually, it was, it was a good experience. So I, I may force myself to, you know, stop living on the box and, and go back to the old fashioned method. Um, and I do tend to print out screenplays, interestingly enough. I do print out a script and go after it. Um, you know, I think part of it is reading, rereading a book you've just written. and. And description bores me. That's inevitably what I have to fix every day when I go back. I was born to be a screenwriter. And so when I do those daily rewrites, usually what the thing that's going in is me saying, please get them out of the white room. <laughs> you know, where are right. they? Right. Um, and so with a screenplay, though, it's, it's all the dialogue. And, and so that's what I love. And that's where I'm focused. And um, but but yeah, you, you've, you've all shamed and inspired me. So I guess I'll go print out this fifth book. I just Well, I'm, I'm going to take the opposite tack. I, um, when I get a submission, 
um, the first read is I dump it into Kindle because you can. You can take any any document the, and dump it into Kindle, and Kindle formats it like a like a book and gives it back to you. Um, and so I read the first read through is in Kindle. The second read when I'm starting to do line edits, I start looking at it online. Um, and if it's pretty clean, I don't do an in paper. Uh, uh, I just do it online and, and then I send it to the, back to the author, get author's changes, and then to the proofreader uh, and to the, and, and, and to, uh, to operations for publishing. Um, but I've, uh, when, once I figured out that I could actually send stuff to Kindle um, and, and just read it like, it like it was the book it's going to be, it became very interesting and I learned a lot. Um, so I'm almost always on the box now. Um, I'm hybrid. If I'm trying to polish inline text, so I only need to be looking at, you know, a couple of consecutive paragraphs, or I'm even just focusing on individual sentences, sure, I work on the box. But if I want to do a sanity check of the whole document, I have to print it out so I can easily flip back and forth and stick post-it notes in uh, key spots so mm -hmm. I can find key passages again. So I don't think it's an either or. I think uh, both techniques have their value. I'm, I'm going to throw out a, a writer's tool. Um, you know, I use a lot of different ones. Final draft for screenplays. I use pages generally for if I am writing a short story. Um, but I use Scrivener for the novels. And it enables me to flip back and forth, like you were saying, Ed, that mm -hmm. speaking, instead of being a sort of long line of, of prose, as in word, it, I, can, I can break it out into chapters and individual scenes under those chapters. So if I want to go back and check something in chapter three and I'm in chapter 15, it's literally a, a click and I'm back there. Um, and I can move scenes easily and, and, uh, and adjust them. And so um, as, as a writer's tool, I think this is a really powerful writing program. I mean, I know that's kind of getting in the weeds, but for any young writers, you know, you kind of want to find this, the, the tech, the, the, the program that's going to make your life easier. And some people still handwrite. My friend Connie Willis handwrites every novel. And uh -huh. then you the biggest. Um, and when I first started, I handwrote my novels um, and, and then moved on to typewriter and then you know, onto a computer. But um, again, it's, it's very individual, but there are all these wonderful tools that can help you. And so kind of play with them and see which one is going to work. Mike Resnick hand wrote almost all of his stuff. And I, uh, I was over his house one time and he took me downstairs and showed me his I love me wall with all the Hugos and all the nebulas sitting there. <laughs> so he clearly was doing something right, bless his soul. Um, and I believe, I believe Connie's got a, a wall like that too. Uh, uh, and I'm going to be the editor here and put in the disclaimer, just because you choose to write your stuff on longhand doesn't guarantee you any Hugos or Nebulas, to be clear. <laughs> That's true. It also doesn't necessarily uh, uh, get an editor agree to read it in longhand. Um, <laughs> Do not. Ever yeah, we get those submissions every now and longhand, then. please. Still? I, I, used to, um, them. I used to edit a magazine that had a lot of engineers writing for it. And I got a 40,000 word article, no, no joke, um, from a guy in India that was written on yellow foolscap with vermilion ink in cursive. And I- On the actually, one hand, cool. On the other hand, oh my God. <laughs> the oh my God one. Um, I sent it back to him and said, please have it typed and send it and, and, and send it back. This was in the days when we were just converting um, from uh, uh, paper and, 
and travelers to run, that ran around the office. Um, and uh, the, the, the waft of rubber cement in the air for Paisley Oh, House. God, yes. <laughs> uh, I actually know how to run a linotype. Um, which dates me considerably. Yeah. But um, uh, so when you, Melinda, you mentioned the bugaboo of a lot of editors, uh, white room. As editors, how do you how do you deal with that when you have a? Uh, it almost always happens for me with an editor who is not as for the uh, an author who's not established a newbie uh and how what do you say to people who give you a manuscript that is full of white room oh i'm sorry for me um oh because it's my my fatal flaw I and mean, it's, it's the thing i have the most trouble with i'm very aware of it um i tell writers uh, when I'm when I'm teaching is is um, sit down and and walk through the five senses. You know what do you smell? What do you hear? What do you see? What can you touch? Because people forget touch. You know how does a paper towel feel when you're drying your hands in a public bathroom? I mean mm -hmm. you know like that. Um, <clears throat> I mean I, I I will say one of the things that I I somewhat regret is that. It seems like only villains smoke anymore, <laughs> but smoking was such a wonderful bit of business. You know, whether you're on screen or on the page, it's like you, know, mm -hmm. you can take out the cigarette case and do, you know, tap the cigarette and do all these things, but try to find business that tells you, that, but the business needs to tell the reader something about that character. So, you know, even And it like, doesn't have to be very long either. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the best opening lines of any uh, of any book that I can remember is one of Heinlein's, and then the door dilated. Mm -hmm. That gi that gives you a room right there, um, and uh, you can either do that or you can do like um, the man who was not Terence O'Grady uh, stood there and smiled which I'm, I'm massacring that quote. It's uh, the first line from uh, um, the first Leiden novel. Um, and uh, it's, it doesn't take a, a lot of words to set the scene, but you do have to set the scene. Otherwise you have people sitting in a white space and they're not even sitting at a table because you haven't you haven't told us that there's a table. You well, haven't told us. <laughs> Go ahead. There's a balance though as well. I mean, I, you know, I find that when I'm really into a story in a book and I hit the long description of the you know the waving fields of grain, I tend to start doing this, looking for you know the people talking again. So I think there's a balance. I mean, you know. I, my hat is off to the people who can write, you know, um, big fat fantasy books, because I know a lot of what makes fantasy is that, that sense of the banquets and the clothing and, you know, the furnishings. And, um, and I'm sort of like, can't I just say interior bedroom night and get on with this and let the scene director handle that for me, you know, the scene designer. Um, so, you know, trying to find that balance too and, and what's appropriate for the genre, but I know you editor types can speak to that. I mean, is there an expectation from a fantasy that they're going to have that lushness? I'll, I'll say this, um, it all comes back to Tolkien, but not, I'm not talking about Lord of the Rings, I'm actually talking about his essay on fairy stories. And this is true for fantasy, for science fiction. It's mm. true for any kind of fiction being written for entertainment. Um, there are caveats where maybe it wouldn't apply. And that's anything that's going to violate what Tolkien refers to as secondary belief, that you're actually in the story, that this is real to you while you're reading it. Anything that violates that is a problem. You should not be doing that. Now, a blank space, that's throwing me out of the moment of the story. Characters who suddenly do something that's not realistic or, you know, a failed alien art exhibit. I mean, you're starting to stretch belief. You can get away with a certain level of that, but every time you're violating secondary belief, you're potentially throwing away your readers and throwing them out of the story, whether it's an absence of detail 
or too much detail or finding the right balance, I find it almost always comes back down to that element, creating that story in that setting and making sure the readers are there. Don't give them a reason to want to put it down. That expectation is very uh, sub-genre specific and even editor specific. So if you're writing hard science fiction, there is a certain amount of description uh, that's appropriate and how much hand waving about the science. And it's a different expectation if you're selling to a techno thriller. And boy, there's a lot of overlap between those markets. Yes, there is. Um, I have a really good friend. He's, we've been friends for 30 years. And he just sent me his first draft of his first novel, which is a techno thriller. And this guy is an expert on um, uh, oil plant safety and cybersecurity. So you can guess what the, what's going on in the story. And just for the hell of it, because I've, uh, I've only edited one techno thriller in my life, uh, I decided to, to, to help him. And so we're going to spend probably the next four or five months um, um, going through this, and I'm going to teach him how to write a techno thriller. Um, and it's going to be pretty good, actually, when the big plant down in Houston goes boom. Uh, um, but it's a, uh, it, 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 everything editors and authors do is trade-offs. Uh, and some editors are, you're going to do it this way because I have been an editor for 75 billion years and I'm telling you this is the way it works. And then you get another editor who says, okay, well, if you want to do it that way, let's try it and see what happens. Chris, yeah. Everything in between. Christopher, where do you, where do you sit on that? Uh, on the, uh, do, on the, the editorial taking control versus letting the author uh, do what they want thing or? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if you're reading your email while you're supposed to be on a panel. No, no. <laughs> I just, I just lost the thread there for a second. Um, I, I mean, I don't know any editor that's going to, to really didactically tell an author it needs to be that way. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know that, that extreme really comes up that much. I've certainly never experienced it or worked with anyone who's, who's uh, not been given a choice. Um, I will not introduce you to the editors I know who do yeah. that sort of thing. Because <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want to work with them, and I, I can't imagine it would be much fun to do that. Um, unless you're working with some other property, right? You're working with uh, a big franchise, and it has to be a certain way because there's uh, pre-existing you know, conventions. Uh, uh, you know, Like, oh, Luke Skywalker wouldn't do that. Well, because he's Luke Skywalker, and uh, Lucasfilm says so. Uh, but... Uh, like we've been saying, you know, throughout the whole thing, right? There's a there's an element of conversation, right? An element of back and forth. I do think it's a mistake, on the other extreme, for an author to not listen to an editor at all, um, because uh, you're too close to your own work very often, right? You need uh, you need an outside perspective, even if it's the wrong one, uh, just to shake you loose from where you are. So, that yeah. that goes back to what I referred to as the why or the what, you know even if you aren't agreeing with what they're saying, why are they identifying that scene or that problem or that character? You know, what's the underlying reason, even if it's not what they think it is. And, and we're running out of time, but you know, I guess where I would sum up to, especially young writers starting out is, this is not an adversarial relationship. Um, this is a team um, and you know, neither one of you wants to produce a bad book, not the writer and not the editor. And so you have to view this as, as almost a collaboration and be okay with that. Um, and, and again, that's why I sometimes think going to Hollywood is very good for people because you really learn to share what you've done and know that other people are gonna be involved. Um, and, you know, it's, it's much less intrusive on novels. So be grateful <laughs> that you're going to be working with a single individual who has purchased, who has selected your book because they care about it. And so, um, 
you have a partner there and you have someone who's on your side. They just want to make it good. And so that's sort of my, my last little, you know, summation of, of this relationship. It's, uh, it's, it's can be a great experience and go into it with that attitude. Okay, why don't we take um, everybody's last comment here. Um, the, the the thing that 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 I like to see is when a when an author um, has uh, put me in, coach. I can do this attitude, um, and it's it's fun to be a coach. It's not fun to be a taskmaster. Uh, sometimes you have to do the other. Um, but mostly you don't. Mostly you can be a coach. And coaching new writers is so, so much fun. Jim? Um, I, well, I'm not sure. Uh, working with new writers can be very rewarding, but it also can be very challenging, especially after you've worked on a lot of fiction and you see the same problems cropping up and again and again. Um, That's um, when you write the book. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I've got better things to do with my time than to actually write her. <laughs> I will say this uh, to all the new writers out there who are trying to break into the field. There's something I always like to try and share as a piece of advice. And that is a quote attributed to Calvin Coolidge. Um, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not, there's nothing, the world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. If you want to be a writer, you're trying to break into the field, you need to write, write, and write some more and submit your babies out there and be ready to get them tortured because um, plenty of us editors are lining up to do just that. <laughs> Chris, Christopher. Uh, well, you know, uh, to follow off of what Jim said, and then once you do, uh, you do sell a story or a novel, and you do sell, just remember what you know. What we've been saying the whole time is this isn't, uh, you know, they're, they're, the editor is not your enemy. Uh, that is a person on the other end of the email, on the other end of the phone line, um, and that is your best ally in getting the story uh, to where it should be, right? Um, and and to be the best version of your vision, right? Um, they are just there to help. Uh, we are too, since I wear both hats, uh, just there to help. Ed? I guess my final thought is the goal is to get to the point of having the relationship with the editor. So at some point, stop editing yourself and send it out there into the world and see how your masterpiece is received. And hopefully your, your masterpiece will be received well. But if that's it doesn't, if it doesn't get, it's not you that's the problem. It, there's something with the manuscript or the venue that you sent it to uh, or something. Um, it, it, it's having your manuscript rejected by an editor is not a judgment on you either as an author or as a person. And I, I know too many authors, even some really big authors who should know better, who get very upset when their stories get rejected because they think it's a, a reflection of them, not the story. Well, we're about done. I would like to thank you all for being here. Uh, and I hope that uh, if there are any young uh, um, authors in the in the audience and you want to continue talking to us, please do. Um, it's my experience that we all uh, are happy to help. And let me just look forward to having a chance to picking up this conversation at a real life convention, hopefully sometime relatively soon and safely. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. Amen to that.